Ha thank you very, very much, um, Tony. Isn't it really comforting to hear uh, another real win-win story? Yeah, it's, it really is comforting. We're now going to have a questions and answer session. Um, our members and the facilitators uh, can ask questions. And uh, I would ask um, the um, questioners to keep the questions short. So I want to give an opportunity to as many people as possible to ask a question. And similarly, I would ask the um, answerers to keep the responses short. Um, so we'll start now. We have our mics around the place as per usual. Which ta table seven? Three. Oh, three. What? Well, sorry, three. <laughs> Thank you, Judge. I'm the facilitator at table three, and um, there's just one question from one of the <coughs> citizens at this table, and it is for Isolt. Um, just in relation to the the different supermarkets that are. Um, handing over food. Is there any Irish retailers like Dunn Stores or Super Value that are donating food to Food Cloud? And if not, why not? Um, so we have worked with a few Super Values and Most Graves are actually one of our biggest donors through the hubs side of it. Um, Dunn's have not yet come on board, um, but I'm sure they will eventually. <laughs> um, you know, we've been doing this for four, uh, only for only four years, and we've got three out of five essentially donating, and we're always growing. So hopefully, we will see um, everyone else follow as well. Thank you. Um, anybody else? Uh, yeah, table seven, uh, maybe. A question for Tony. <coughs> if your neighbours were to get involved in organic farming, surely you would be competing with each other into the same farmer's market and so forth. So that would perhaps drive down your prices. Yeah. Do I need to switch this on? Or is no, it on? no, it's on. Yeah. Yeah. It's on. Okay. Uh, yes, and um, we have been involved in bringing apprentices onto our farm exactly to help them to become organic farmers and growers. And it doesn't really bother me that they uh, would go into production. Um, th there is the son of the guy who put up the tunnels with me, who has recently just done that and is turning up <coughs> in the markets beside me. Yeah, uh, so th 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 that doesn't bother me in the slightest. There is a growing market for organic food. Uh, th there is a, a paragraph in the paper, which I didn't actually get to mention to you, uh, but next week I'm joining Board B on a fact-finding tour in, in Britain. Um, and when they invited us to attend, they talked about opportunities for import substitution. And apart from opportunities for import substitution, there are huge possibilities for export of organic food. The German and French markets between them account for 20% <coughs> of global consumption of organics. Right? They're not a million miles away from us, those markets. Yeah. So there is plenty of opportunity for people to get involved in, in growing. And indeed, to some degree, the people who are really interested in growing are getting in without even the grant scheme uh, to, to help them. The grant scheme probably has more relevance for bigger scale farmers, for people in tillage, for people in uh, dairy, and for people in uh, livestock. But for people who are getting to, to involved in growing, it's not a... Uh, Lots of them will make that decision anyway because there is a return from the market. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, table five. Uh, this question is for Tony. I'm the facilitator for table five, and the, one of the citizens at this table asked, would Tony consider uh, being involved and supporting Food Cloud? Yes. Yeah. Food, food Cloud. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Yes, um, table nine, yes. Uh, yes, I'm the facilitator for table nine. Uh, there's a question for Mr. McHugh. Um, how many uh, farms in Ireland would he consider being smart farms similar to his? Well, I would hope all are smart farms. I think you're asking what are the issues, I presume you're asking what are the issues behind people adopting new technologies and becoming better. And uh, yeah, so, you're, so to my mind, 
there's a couple of issues. Uh, the real one is knowledge transfer, is getting people to know what changes will help them. Uh, most farmers work on their own. So they, are thing, they have things they're good at, and they have things they're not good at. So if you can get someone to go into them and look at another pair of eyes in the farm, they will see things that the farmer himself wouldn't see. In discussion groups, I talked that I was in a dis discussion group and I have found it invaluable. But I know within my own co-op and dairy farmers, there's far more dairy farmers in discussion groups than beef farmers proportionally. But within my own dairy co-op, there's only, I think it's 31% are in discussion groups. And so what the dairy co-op would have done to try and transfer this knowledge is they actually have paid the wages of three Chagas advisors who work just going around the dairy farmers within our co-op. And several co-ops do that. But that is a huge issue, knowledge transfer. Chagas don't have enough money. And dairy co-ops are doing their best to transfer knowledge, but there needs to be more money put into both research, but mainly transferring knowledge to farmers so that if you tell a farmer he can make money by doing something simple, he'll do it. But if he doesn't know it or can't recognize it within his own farm because he's overworked and he's, he doesn't have time to go out, he's working from maybe seven in the morning till nine in the evening, any extra time he has is for his family. He doesn't have time to go out to groups to listen. So to reach out to them with knowledge transfer is, is an issue. Yeah. Yes. Any other questions? Uh, yes. Uh, I've uh, t two questions for Andrew. Um, just the first question uh, is, is there a heat pump system uh, that will cool the milk uh, and heat your outbuildings <laughs> and or the home? Um, and uh, the second one, um, uh, is there a plan? I mean, we, we, we've heard about, again, about um, uh, fining um, or levying uh, businesses that uh, over or put too much carbon into the atmosphere. Is there a plan to pay a subsidy to uh, a farmer if he has a surplus uh, of carbon credits? Um, as I think you, you will probably have if you implement uh, those plans uh, to put solar power uh, and maybe some wind on, on your farm. Uh, the first question you have there as regards the heat pump, uh, there is two, two issues on a, in, a, in a milking parlor, which is what you're talking about. A third of the energy is spent cooling the milk, uh, but there's also energy spent on heating water to wash the machine. So uh, what has happened is there is a a heat transfer system, which it uses to uh, take the, the hot air coming from the compressor to heat uh, the water, the hot water that's needed. Uh, again, if you have a system that's presently in, it's not worthwhile putting in a new one. But if you're putting in a new plant, it's worthwhile doing it. So again, if you have some sort of a, uh, a pilot scheme, it will be taken up again. The second question was subsidies on, on uh, uh, if you have carbon, uh, carbon credits or extras, uh, I suppose, I don't know of anything yet. Alan Matthews, who was speaking here earlier, was talking about uh, trying to put a cost on it. And I was listening to him and I was thinking, my goodness, no matter what way you try and implement that, uh, there are serious negatives involved. Because if you try and put it, on the, put it in as a cost on the processing level, yeah. then you will end up what will happen, say, in the beef industry, which has a huge amount of cattle of their own? Will they try and transfer all that cost back onto the farmers and not affect themselves? If you do it in dairying, is it, it's going over everybody, it's not going over people who are improving things. Uh, if you put it on the cow, say per cow, it'll uh, push people into having cows on grass, to having less cows indoors, and even though you have less cows, you have actually more carbon, because they're indoors. So there's an awful lot. If you look at the farm system, or even in Northern Ireland, where cows are indoors producing twice as much, two cows here produce the same as one up there, if we've lower carbon if you're on grass. So it's exceptionally complicated. And I don't have an answer. Yeah. Are you happy with that answer? <laughs> I, 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 I thought Alan was saying that the measurement uh, was, was the difficulty. Did I misunderstand that? Uh, yeah, I think he said a measurement, but also a payment, which would then get paid back. Oh, so, yeah, yeah, so if you pay, then who pays and how? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, table 11. Judge, I'm the facilitator for table 11, and I have two questions. The first one is for Andrew. 
if the forestry scheme changed to maybe a contract of time to change the land back to farming, would the farmers consider doing it on part of the farm? And the second question is for Isolt. Does Isolt think that supermarkets have a lot to answer, sorry, a lot to answer for regarding food waste with their constant offers of buy three for 14 euro or buy one or get one at half price, etc. Oh, yeah. uh, as regards to forestry, yeah, there's plenty of issues in forestry. Plenty of them are the mindset, which was mentioned in, by the previous speakers uh, of farmers of you've been a failure. And part of it is looking to the future. If I put land into forestry now, I can never remove it. I have taken away any options forever. Uh, so the time or the necessity or the signing of the contract which says that if you put it in forestry and you take a subsidy, it must remain in forestry forever. You can change into agriculture later, but you must plant somewhere else. Uh, and I think it would be a huge help if that was removed. Um, but I think also schemes have changed over the years. Initially schemes came in and they were, I think, 18 years long and then they dropped to 15 years and then the rates that they were paying were dropped. And there's that kind of fear in the background. It's all down to the government. They can change it whenever they want. And there's yeah. that fear. There's no actual certainty as yeah. to, to the payment that will arise. Yeah. Who, who uh, determines the period? The government. The government. And does culture have any involvement? No. No, no. Yeah, just, just a quick wondering is else question two for one yeah. yeah um so food waste is an incredibly complex problem and um over 30 percent of it is happening in households the average irish household actually spends 700 euro a year on food they throw away i think there's a shared responsibility there um a lot of the supermarkets actually have stopped doing the buy one get one free offers and have kind of gone more on the discount side, so 50%. So there is progress being made there, but um, there's also a huge educational piece that needs to be done at a consumer level to help us understand how we can stop spending 700 euro on average on throwing away food. But for example, one of the challenges a supermarket might have is if you walk into a store at 8 p.m. and there is one loaf of bread left on the shelf, there is one apple, one banana, you're probably going to walk out of that supermarket and go to the one next door that has a shelf full of fresh looking food. So the way that it's set, the way that we expect to have our food provided to us through supermarkets and the way that they meet those expectations is one of the reasons that food waste occurs. Then also for ourselves to understand simple things like don't shop when you're hungry, make a list. There are small actions that we can take to actually pre prevent ourselves wasting food at the home. And I know the Environmental Protection Agency run a great uh, program called Stop Food Waste. And you can go on to their website, stopfoodwaste.ie, to actually understand a lot of the ways that we can prevent food waste happening um, to begin with. But because this is such a complex problem that's happening at each stage of the food supply chain, from farm, manufacturing, distribution, retail, consumer, I think um, pointing blame at one specific area and focusing in on that area isn't necessarily the most effective way to address it. I think we need to understand that it is happening at all stages. And that's why for us, I think introducing a standard form of measurement so that we understand where food waste is happening and how at each stage, so that we can then really develop actions that will help us address food waste at each stage. But it need, we need a holistic approach. Um, and I think there is a different level of responsibility at each stage of the supply chain to address this. Very interesting, yeah. Any other question? Yes, at table 14. Um, I'm the facilitator at table 14, and one of the citizens has a question for all three members of the panel. What is the one thing that the government could do to help you further your goals? Yeah, we'll start with Andrew, yeah. <laughs> or do you want, did you want to pass? <laughs> no, I don't mind. Well, I suppose the, if you talk about me personally, um, you saw the slides I had at the end as regards green energy. Like, it's the next, st next step ahead where I can produce and use my own energy and any excess can be 
put back into the grid. So producing my own energy is probably, for me, the first thing. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, for the industry as a whole, I think yeah. knowledge transfer and research. Yeah, we, we encountered that issue last, at, at the, the last weekend, <coughs> about the fact that here there isn't a, a process um, for putting your own energy back into the grid and mm. uh, I, I, I get, getting remuneration for it, as it were. Yeah. Um, Isolt? Um, so, as I uh, mentioned, I think introducing a standard form of measurement is act would actually um, be a big step, um, particularly in large companies, but also in small companies. But I'm also going to caveat that by, with saying that it would actually it is expensive to do this, and um, if you take the smaller farmers, etc., I think that there would also be a need for financial supports um, to encourage. Uh, measurement, prevention and redistribution of surplus food, ensuring that we follow the food waste hierarchy. So I would like to see um, standard reporting across the whole sector in Ireland so that we can really understand the problem. But I think then if we're going to solve it and if we're going to do this, there will be a need for financial support um, to come alongside that. And do you envisage the su financial support coming from the state? Yeah, so I think it's worked very well where there have been um, tax incentives in place to incentivise the redistribution of surplus food. Yes, thank you very much. Tony? I, I'm, I agree with what Andrew has said. Uh, I, it is one of the things that I pointed to in my own paper. But the, I, I still think that the most pressing thing that the uh, government could do, and this is not about me personally, but it is about... Uh, opening up the organic sector to the development that's potentially there is to reinstate the, uh, the, the grant payments, to do something serious about research. At the moment, uh, I, I, there is nobody I can turn to in this country in terms of agricultural research in organics. Uh, there are little peripheral programs. Uh, Gary mentioned to you about the project in, in Cork looking at the use of clover and grassland. Um, but if I'm to develop my skills as a farmer, I am dependent on just the what's happening elsewhere in the agricultural sector. I can learn from smart farming techniques as any other farmer can, but there is no actual specific program of research or education or, tr well, there are some farm walks organized by Chagask, which is organic farmers talking to other organic farmers, a bit like the discussion groups that uh, Andrew has mentioned. So there's knowledge transfer at that level. But there is no serious commitment to organics at a government level, and I would say that needs to be addressed. It is the most important issue, uh, in my view. Thank you very much. Um, yes, table two. Thank you. Uh, this is mainly for Andrew. Looking at your, your particular your last slide and listening to other speakers throughout the session, what is wrong? Uh, with our politicians that they will not bring a feed-in tariff for solar panels because it wouldn't be just an advantage to farming people but to householders, schools, industry. What is the problem? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Andrew, I you pulled the short straw there. Yeah. Yeah, I don't mind, I don't mind. It's actually a, a, a politician from a neighbouring constituency has that role but I've read the white paper that the government has out at the moment on energy, on renewable energy, and um, to be perfectly honest, the answer is money. The longer the government wait, the cheaper technologies become, so therefore the government has to put in less money. So the longer the government can wait, the less it'll cost them, and that's why they're waiting and waiting. That's my reading of it. Uh, reading the white paper, it says, so. Uh, Wind in various parts of the country are economically viable by this state and this state and this state, depending on the part of the country going up to 2030. Likewise, it says the same with solar. And likewise, it says that solar on, on roof space actually is the best because it's consumed. But that's why they're waiting. Solar panel prices are dropping the whole time. Technology is changing. Things are becoming cheaper. So therefore, they're waiting, waiting, waiting. That's my read on it. I may be wrong, but that's. Yes, very good. Uh, uh, table five? Yeah. Um, so this is for a question for the two farmers, um, and I suppose it's already been answered partially with different phrasing, uh, but what policy or absence of policy is discouraging uh, your respective models of farms from being adopted throughout the country, and then what policy implementations 
would encourage them the same way. Andrew, would you go first? Yeah, I don't yeah. mind. Uh, actually, strangely yeah. enough, as regards the policies and so on, I actually think the government is pushing them. It is putting chagas towards pushing them. The big issues within it, uh, I think they're doing great work, but the issues within it is uh, getting the information to farmers and continuing the research because a lot more can be done. And I think those are the two big issues. It's not actually a policy issue, it's more, you look at Chagas, Chagas during the, the downturn, people were told to retire, they weren't replaced. And it was even all their paperwork, which they used to do, they put it out to other organizations to try and get them to do it, to put all the resources into research, education, and transferring knowledge. But they don't have the resources. And that's why co-ops are trying to step in and do their best. That's why IFA is trying to step in and do their best. And farmers in discussion groups are trying to do it amongst each other. But really, it's a question of we need more bodies on the ground going out to farmers, getting that knowledge across. And we need more research as well. But really, it's knowledge transfer. Yeah. Tony, what's your view? Yeah, it, it, it's exactly, uh, well, I am in a situation where I, I am less well resourced as an organic farmer than the generality of, of farmers. And the, um, it, I mean, what needs to happen is, since the budget probably isn't going to grow, we need to reach agreement with the other farmers that there would be a reallocation of resources which is not an easy thing to achieve, <laughs> um, you know, short, short of growing the budget, uh, because the, 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 actual, um, um, the actual amount <coughs> of land under, it's, it's, some bit of this is chicken and egg. There's about 1.6% of the utilizable land in the countries in organics. There's a government target, I think, is 5% by 2020 or 2025, whichever of those plans uh, it, it, it was in. There's not a hope in hell of that being achieved because nobody else can come into the scheme and get the, the payment for the, particularly for the difficult conversion period when you, when you need, uh, when your outputs from your farm, because if you change your inputs, if you change from what you're doing, you have an immediate drop in what you're producing on your farm. So that the, the grant scheme is skewed to give you extra income to take you over those initial two years before you get to the point of having organic produce for sale that presumably the market will pay you for and you, uh, you but that scheme is just not there now. Uh, so I, I'm repeating what I said earlier really. You know, yeah. Very good. Um, we've had a very interesting questions and answer session and to conclude it I am going to uh, share with you a question I was asked this afternoon and that I don't know the answer to. I was asked, why uh, don't we use black wattle? And I said, uh, black wattle. And they said, you know, wattle and dobe. And uh, I still didn't get the message. And then I was reminded of two lovely lines from a poem by W.B. Yeats, which you all learned at school. I will arise and go now and go to Inish Free and a small cabin build there of clay and wattle made. Clay and wattle, wattle. And um, it was suggested to me that wattle is leguminous. Um, it was also suggested to me that um, um, it, 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 it would be useful um, in, in terms of ecology if it was used. I don't know if that is true, but it is food for thought, and it's food for thought I'm leaving you with um, at the conclusion of um, this question and answer session. I want to t thank all of the speakers, um, um, the speakers on our panel and all of the speakers today. Um, we really did get inspiring contributions, and they will inform our thinking when it comes to making recommendations, as we must do tomorrow. Um, on how the state uh, can make Ireland a leader in tackling climate change. It's been a very busy day. Um, there was a lot of concentration involved. Um, um, I just hope everybody has a, a pleasant evening and um, uh, I hope to see the members and the facilitators and um, members of our EAG um, this evening at 7.15. But uh, can I say once again, Many thanks to all our contributors.